Patty is going to sign us on to Facebook. Uh, some of you might ask why, not Facebook, YouTube. You know, we had three views last week. Hopefully that's because most everybody was here. Um, but you might wonder why we do it kind of the way we do is we don't want the kids on YouTube. We don't want them out there. We respect their privacy and their safety, really. Uh, there's all sorts of weirdos out there. Plus, um, on the prayer concerns, people are more and more um, private about their, their hurts and their asking for prayers. They, they don't want the whole world to know. And yes, with three views on Facebook, there's probably little danger of that happening. But we would like it to grow. And so we're trying to start out with uh, a part of a safe sanctuary type of idea. So welcome to our viewers out there on YouTube. Greetings, peace, love, and joy in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ on the second Sunday of Easter. And we're glad that you're joining us. Um, we, uh, we, you know, we do our offering different. We don't pass the plate. We have it out front. You just drop it in the plate as you come in. But we are going to uh, bless it and have a, a prayer about it at this time. Dear Lord, as we uh, make our gifts to you, it is our effort to reaffirm your resurrection power. We need resurrection power. We need resurrected. Our faith, our, our love for one another is in need of a resurrection somehow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go, Carol. Crown him Lord of all. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Thank you, everybody. Um, if the children would come out, that'd be great. Hey, I sure do. Uh, Carol knows. Did you play that song for me? Because, uh, that I like old songs done in a new way. And that, that's kind of what I feel like was done there. It's kind of rearranged a little bit. Well done. All right. Are you going to sit up front? Or you can sit up. You can sit in a chair or you can sit on the floor. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter to me. Well, are you aware of all the stuff that's going on nowadays out in the world? Or are you just busy having fun? 
busy having fun. Okay, I like that. Well, we're going to hear, uh, I'm going to tell you a story about Thomas. Thomas was one of Jesus' disciples, one of his students. And he wasn't there the first time Jesus um, appeared before them. And so when they said that Jesus had risen from the dead, Thomas didn't believe them. He says, I'm not going to believe that Jesus is raised from the dead until I see the nails, holes in his hand and the the place where the spear stabbed him in his side and his feet where the nails went. I'm not going to believe. And then Jesus showed up and showed Thomas. And Thomas believed. He says, my Lord and my God. Right? Well, um, Thomas wanted Jesus ID do you know what an ID is I'm gonna show you this is my driver's license and it's not gonna be good for much longer because Oklahoma is doing a thing called real ID and you have to provide all sorts of other papers to prove who you are how do you know who I am if I don't have an identification card, right? I don't know. You don't know. I mean, I could be Jake Legg. That, that could be my name. You, I, I just lied to you all this time. You, need, you want proof, right? A birth certificate. You need an ID, a real ID <clears throat> with my picture on it. And it says all sorts of information about me, Right? Amazingly, it's still pretty correct. My eyes are still brown, and I still weigh 200 pounds. I'm working on it, folks. Yeah. But at least I didn't put on weight, right? Goodness. So, so how would... So even Jesus was asked for an ID. His, what, what was it that made Thomas believe? He, saw, he knew it had to be Jesus. He had to be raised from the dead, didn't he? And do you see the funny little driver's license we got up here? It's got Jesus on it. That's kind of... I don't know whether he was from Trinidad and Tobago, but that's just what I found on the Internet. Because Jesus didn't really have a driver's license or a real ID. Jesus had something even better than that. He had proof of who he was. He was... Jesus Christ, the King, raised from the dead. Dear Lord, we pray that uh, we would have no doubt who you are, that we can uh, literally uh, know for sure without it, an ID that you are who you say you are. You are uh, the Lord of all. You're the King of kings. This is our prayer, dear Lord, that we may believe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, sweetheart. Glad you're here with us this morning. All right. We're singing hymns this week. Praise the Lord. And this is We Are the Church.
explain how um, later. And you'll need to turn on that. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. As the believers were one in heart and mind, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in, all, in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Linda. As always, she does a good job. Um, that is a picture of Mount Edgecombe. It is a dormant volcano that is across the bay from Sitka, Alaska, in uh, eastern Alaska. You've probably heard of Sitka, but you probably didn't know that it had a right beside a volcano. Of course, that's the Pacific Rim. There's a lot of volcanoes there. At that last erupted 4,000 years ago. But on April the 1st, 1974, smoke once again rose from uh, the peak. And the phones in Sitka rang off the, the hook. 1974, there'd still be, <laughs> you'd still put your phones on a hook. Uh, and they sent a Coast Guard um, helicopter up to the volcano to uh, uh, look down. And, and what did he see inside the, the caldera? Not um, bubbling lava, but 70 old tires on fire. Um, and an April Fool's message spray painted in the snow. Okay, the architect of this prank um, was 50 years old at the time, Oliver Porky Bicker. And he was a World War II vet veteran. He had stormed the beaches in Normandy. And he was uh, well known for pulling pranks, for... Um, uh, he was actually a golfer as well, a professional golfer. He was a, uh, good at that. So he had been waiting. Um, he, it, the, the idea for this prank came to him in 1971. But he had spent the intervening years collecting old tires and then waiting for an April 1st that was crystal clear so that everybody could see it. And he woke up on April 1st um, in 1974, and the conditions were optimal. And he told his wife, I have to have a go for it today. And in the words, immortal words of wives everywhere, she responded, just don't make an ass of yourself. <laughs> so, so he takes a helicopter and he has all these tires slung on a rope all the way up to the mountain and they dump them off and he soaks them in kerosene and sets them on fire and then takes in 50 foot letters April Fools. Now, he had informed, he, he wasn't a, a complete fool, he had informed the FAA 
the fire department and the police department of the prank. But he'd forgot to notify the Coast Guard. <laughs> and so they sent, um, they sent a, a helicopter to uh, investigate. Now, once most of the residents of um, Sitka were told that it was a, a joke, they thought it was tremendous, right? Evidently, they've got a good sense of humor. I like that. And even the admiral of the um, uh, Coast Guard uh, said that Bicker's prank was brilliant. <laughs> I mean, that'd be sweet if you could think of one that good. Well, we're just 10 days past uh, April Fool's. And uh, I'm going to take a little poll. How many of you like to play April Fool's jokes on people? Mm, that, why does that not surprise me? Oh, okay. A couple. And how many of you have had a joke pulled on you and you were fooled? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's hard to admit sometimes that we've been fooled. I know I don't like to admit it, but I have. Uh, did you know that there are some scientific studies that claim that there's a correlation between high intelligence and gullibility? In other words... And this is no joke. I'm not, try, I'm not trying to pull a joke on you. Um, the smarter you are, the more likely you are to fall for something. Ricky Jay is a famous magician. And he was considered by many to be the best with sleight of hand type um, magic tricks. And he was asked one time what the ideal audience would be for a magic show that he was putting on. And he said, uh, Nobel Prize winners. Nobel Prize winners because uh, they have an ego that says that they can't be fooled, and yet you can fool them every time. All right? I says, uh, no one is easier to fool than a smart person, according to this magician. Now, and if that offends you, by the way, you might want to check your ego. <laughs> All right. Um, Harry Houdini. One of my dad's favorite illusionist, magicians, escape artists, and stuff like that. He once said of his good friend, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle of Sherlock Holmes fame, he said, the poor man falls for the simplest trick. <laughs> so, listen, the first recipients of the good news of Easter um, when, when they heard that good news, it was, uh, they didn't believe it, right? For one, it was told to them by distraught uh, women, you know, hysterical women that at the time weren't considered trustworthy. Thank goodness, you know, you've come a long way, baby. Uh, they didn't believe it. But then more and more evidence uh, started coming out, and more and more people did start to believe it, um, it, it gained credibility. The most famous holdout of the group was Thomas. Uh, Downing Thomas, Didymus means the twin. He wasn't going to be fooled. Thomas wasn't going to be fooled. So I think, um, I don't think, I think that there's in times in our lives when we can all identify with Thomas. Um, because we too have doubted, we too have uh, rebelled, and there's just something in him that we recognize. But as I, I believe I wrote it up here, yes. Um, doubt is one of the most important tools that God uses to produce mighty men and women of faith. I sometimes wonder if God doesn't deliberately put obstacles uh, to faith in our paths so that we might struggle to overcome them and come out of it stronger. It seems cl clear to me that God intends for us to struggle. It's part of his plan. Uh, struggle with th the great questions of life. To never have doubted is to never really have taken your walk in faith seriously. Let's add, however, that in order to experience true joy, 
that God wants for all of his children is that we have to move beyond our doubts and our fears uh, into a faith that is stronger than our doubts. Much of the, the doubt that um, it's our rebellious nature. Uh, we experience uh, things like this in our young uh, adulthood, in our, our childhood. We, we rebel against our upbringing. And again, I suspect that this is part of God's plan. Uh, think about it. Your offspring would never leave home <laughs> if, you got, if you didn't disagree about something, right? They'd be living in your basement forever. So probably it's a good thing that young kids are a little on the rebellious side. Jesus didn't condemn the prodigal son after leaving. Uh, all of us uh, must leave from time to time, it's, but it's part of the maturation process. The important thing is that we don't stay in the pig's eye forever. That we wise up. We do start believing. We do stop rebelling. And we come um, into spiritual maturity. Ready to move beyond our fears and doubts. This world is far too wonderful just to have been created by chance. Remember when I showed you all the mathematics of how um, uh, the number of, of atoms in the universe uh, that it would take to all align just, just right in order for all of this to have taken by accident. There is a, there is a creator behind it all. And we hunger for a relationship with that creator. We were born for relationship, not just with each other, but with God too. I think it's far more difficult not to eventually move beyond our, our doubts uh, than it is to stay stuck in doubt our entire lives. There's just too much evidence out there, right? Um, some of us see God everywhere. You know, is that a burning bush or are we just picking blackberries? The Christian faith can only be analyzed from the inside uh, and if you remain on the outside looking in, you're never ever going to find that abundant life. So what happened to Thomas after he declared, uh, my Lord and my God? What, what power did that resurrection uh, of the risen Christ have for powder? Well, um, in his career, it is a little bit wrapped in, in mystery, and we're not completely sure of exactly thing. But there is a legend, and it was written down in the apocryphal book, the legend of Thomas, part of the, um, you know, there's, there's several books that didn't make it into the Bible, and that's one of them. But it gives us a history of Thomas, and it says that uh, when the disciples divided themselves up to go all into the world to different places, um, I, I don't I think, they drew lots, I'm not sure. But anyway, they are all distributed all over the world to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Thomas got India. And he went there, and there is still a church in South India today, the Thomas Church of South India, which claims that Thomas was their founder. And Thomas, so he dropped his doubts at the feet of Jesus Christ. He went to a foreign country, and he uh, proclaim the good news, and that faith is still alive and active today. There are probably as many Christians in India today as there is in the United States. How can that be? Well, when you got a bazillion, bazillion people, even if a small fraction of them are Christians, it's a strong presence. Uh, same way with China today. Okay. So let's move on to Acts 4. And how does it tie in with the story of Thomas? I struggled uh, I, with the lectionary. You know, uh, there's the Old Testament, the New Testament, the epistle, and the psalm. And they're all bundled together with a common theme. But when I looked at those this week, I couldn't figure out what that common theme was. I'm kind of slow. <clears throat> and then sometimes, you know, just bam. It, it, it dawned on me. Now my challenge is to 
express to you kind of what I think it is and how it all works out. So, in the, um, at, in the epistle lesson today, with great power the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, in verse 33. So if the resurrection of uh, Christ from the dead was incredible, uh, a power of resurrection, then it was, it, it was demonstrated in the early church what, what happened was absolutely unimaginable. Who would have guessed that this little band of early believers, they didn't have any building, they didn't have any budget, they didn't have any marketing plan, not even a band. They had no political power, no prestige, no great persuasive ability. But none of that mattered because they had seen the risen Savior and they were infused with power. They had victory in Jesus before they even started. And they had been given a commission by Christ that they couldn't ignore. So the next, uh, in verse uh, 32, it says, And all the believers were of one heart and one mind. Can you imagine the radical nature of that statement in the first, first century world where slavery, slavery was rampant then, really, just as it is now in the 21st century where uh, women and children are trafficked. Every time I hear that word trafficked, I get a little bit angry because what they are doing is you're, when you traffic someone, you're not just moving them from place to place you more than likely are putting them into sexual bondage and slavery. It's synonymous with slavery. And a lot of these folks still struggle to escape their, their uh, captors, which in, in our current situation is the drug cartels. You know, it used to be drugs was kingpin. Now it seems to be um, uh, migrants. You know, the... So that you know that the, the Chinese and the Iranians, they are all unified, right? If you watch the news, they're unified. Well, everybody loves Xi Jinping in China, right? He's the, he's the head honcho. They love him. And did you know that according to, uh, oh, Masad Abadinejad, can't say his name very well, uh, in, in uh, India, not in Iran, says that there is not one single homosexual in Iran. He says, it, and if you know one, let, let me know. That's what he said. See, <clears throat> that's what the party officials say, is that they are completely unified. People need to be unified, but they need to be unified with Christ at the center, not on politics. Politics is the science of division and force. It is not, it does not create unity. There were needy people among them. This is verse 34. Now some people aren't comfortable with this passage because it seems uh, to be a forerunner of certain uh, social systems uh, in our country, socialism and communism, communes in general. But uh, this came about, you know, centuries uh, as an experiment before those uh, socialism and communism became a, a, uh, a thing. It predates those living styles by many centuries. In fact, what the Christians were doing was exactly the opposite of those things. It is not, the way the Christians were living, it is not forcing people to share by taking what they had worked hard for and giving it to another, but rather sharing out of a changed heart. That makes all of the difference in the world Which, because it blesses the giver, the receiver, and God. Communism says, what is yours is mine, I'll take it. But koinonia, 
the Greek word. It says, what is mine is God's. Or, <laughs> what's, yeah, what, what's mine is God's. Let's share it. It's a totally different way of thinking. True sharing is not a matter of legislating uh, taxes and governmental welfare systems. It is a matter of love and liberty and grace. And that is the power of the resurrection. That it can take people, make people actually want to share out of sheer love for their neighbor. That commune only failed failed after only a, a few years. Uh, they always do. The unified community didn't last long before sin entered in and the greed of Ananias and uh, Sapphira. Uh, and you can read about them in, in uh, chapter, tw uh, chapter 5, the one that um, comes right after chapter 4, which we read. Now, while it didn't last long, Koinonia this it was powered by uh, the resurrection it was unified on Jesus Christ and its expression was uh, grace for all grace for all what we we want to aspire to that but folks we're, we're not there yet I'm afraid These were people that were still uh, euphoric over the infusion of the, the Holy Spirit of, of Christ at the resurrection. And they were centered on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. That is what we have to do as a church as, as well to bring others to Christ. What ties these scriptures together is the power of the resurrection to change people. The resurrection has power to change people. I don't know about you, but I want to be changed. Change isn't easy, but I want to be changed. Believe. I'm asking you. I implore you. I'm charging you. I'm giving you a, a, a challenge. Believe and be changed. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all of God's people say, Amen. Our, we got a closing hymn. We're singing. They'll know we are Christians by our love. See how it all fits in? That just happens by magic. No. <laughs> Actually, I try real hard to, to make it all fit. So, Carol, hit it.
Okay. I should have used more of that song in the sermon. Lord of mercy, be with us as we go from this place today. Fill our lives with your love. Help us to bring the good news of hope and peace wherever we go. Let us truly be people of the resurrection, the Easter people. And all of God's people say, go in peace.